Well, we've been in this series, yes. And in this series, it's been six already messages, two separate sections. We're in the third section now. We're looking at our story. We're looking at the scriptures. How many of you know that the Bible is not a bunch of little stories that are all separated? It's really one whole story with a lot of different authors journeying man's history with God and the story of God in our lives. And so we've been looking at that. And so we started beginning this conversation about uh, fearless trust, looking at Abraham and talking about this partnership or this partner, God saying, I'm looking for partners on the earth. This is my plan. My plan is to bless people through you. So I'm choosing you, not because you bring anything to the table. I bring everything, you bring nothing. But I'm just choosing you. Your name is Abraham. Okay, and I'm gonna bless you. And you are going to be a blessing. And then we look at how God brings that about in Abram's life. And we just looked at three parts of that. But then after that, we talked about now how God was with this nation that came from Abraham called Israel as he led them out of bondage, out of slavery, out of Egypt, into the wilderness, into this space where they were going to need him every single day for everything. And we talked about this as a fearless provision or this how he provides, provider. And they were just learning. And he said, I'm gonna test you here in this time. And the whole point is to draw you close. Why? Because you're on a journey. And your journey has a destination called the promised land. It's a place of promise. It's a place of limitless provision. It's a reality where all your needs are covered. They're available to you, and I'm leading you there. But before we get there, I've got to teach you how to trust me here. And if we learn to trust God in those seasons, those wilderness times where we don't know where provision's going to come from, we don't have extra anything. We can't go to Starbucks. We don't have extra clothing. We, we don't know if we're going to pay the bills. We move into those seasons where it's like, God, are you there? And he says, yes, I am. I want to teach you to trust me. And so we looked at the lessons from those three encounters in the wilderness, and now we're moving into this promised land. Now it's finally time to go in. And there are lessons in the promised land, just as there were lessons in the wilderness. There's testing when there's enough and plenty, just as there's testing when there isn't enough and there isn't plenty. Are you with me? Everything God's doing, by the way, is about this. It's about the heart. And so I'm going to take you to two major books today. They're both in the Old Testament. We'll pepper in some New Testament scriptures. But if you want to open your Bibles, those of you online as well, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. There's two passages in Deuteronomy that we're going to look at. And then also put your finger or put your little red, your little tabby somewhere. Um, those of you who are like, I got my thing. You can look it up when we get there. In Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And I'll explain as we get to those books. But we're now looking at the promised land. They're about to go in. And they're on the precipice of going into this land. And in this place... In this place, in the wilderness, we ask the question, can God be trusted? And that's what they were learning. Can I trust God every day or not? But in this promised land, we ask the question, do I really need God? Do I really need God? By the way, it is a question asked today. In our cultural context, it's very, very relevant. Do I need God? Or what do I actually need God for? Like what areas? Is he in addition to my life in certain spaces? Does he help straighten my wife out when she needs it? Does he help my kids get online, on track? Does he fix my husband and all his issues? God, if you can do that, then yes, I need you. That's the question of the promised land. So in the wilderness, we're talking about fearless trust. Our trust looks like fearless dependence. That's what we were talking about before. But now as we move into the promised land, 
our trust looks like fearless generosity. Because you move into a space where there's water and bread and all that you need to the fill, the question is then, what do I do in that space? One, this fearless trust looks like dependence every day. Can I just say, God, you're enough for me? The other generosity, what do I do with all that you've given? Deuteronomy chapter eight is where I'm gonna begin, but just to give you some context to this, so those of you who are new to Bible stuff, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible were all written by Moses. Deuteronomy is written right before Israel goes into the promised land. Now Moses is the one God uses to lead them out, to lead them through the wilderness. 40 years they've been in the wilderness. They tried to go in once and they didn't trust God and they didn't make it in. They went back. Now 40 years later, they're coming back to the edge. They're about to go into the promised land and Moses records what he tells the people before he goes to be with the Lord. He's gonna die. God tells him, you can't go into the promised land. And so now Moses says, these are my last words. If you can see it from the heart of a shepherd, the heart of a a pastor, this is what he was. He was the pastor of these people. He loved them. He cared about them. He had been with them. And he says, I can't go with you into the promised land, but please hear me now. And that's the heart behind what Moses is saying in Deuteronomy. And that's the heart behind this right here in chapter eight. He's preparing them for what they're about to go into. And I want you to hear it, and then I'll break down only parts of it, and we'll keep moving. This is all still intro, just so you know. (laughs) Moses says, so you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good Land, a good season, a place like America, like the United States. I just sang that out loud. You got to hear that for yourself. This is a unique place on planet Earth. Grateful to live here. Amen? Amen. He's bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and springs flowing out of the valleys and hills. Imagine that. You're coming from a parched desert. And he's talking about flowing streams and valleys and, and, and rivers and, oh, come on, springs. Fountains, springs flowing out of the, the valleys and hills, the land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. The land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. You shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he gives you, here he has given you. That sounds pretty awesome. And if you're catching the story, remember this, God intends to do you good only always. It is no small thing. It's his delight to do you good. It is his delight to do you good. Do you hear me? He wants to see you thrive in every area of your life. That's why his ways are so important for us to walk in. So, here's the test. Take care, lest you forget the Lord, your God, by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good homes and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you out of the flint, uh, brought water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you. Why? To do you good in the end. Why? To do you good in the end. 
Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power, my power, the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Lest when you get there and experience all of its blessings and abundance, lest when you're in a place where you have all that you need and you are comfortable in your homes, you say, in your heart, this is so important, my hand has gotten me this. The strength of my arm has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he might confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. He is working behind you to bless you like he promised Abraham he would do. And everything that you're doing, and it seems so successful for you, is what he ordained for you to step into. Without him, you wouldn't even be able to get it. Do you see it? As it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods, and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today, you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. He led them into the land. He made covenant with them in the wilderness and told them, this is my promised blessing for your life. But along with the promised blessing comes a promised curse Some of you getting a little afraid. Don't worry, we're gonna get into the new covenant in a minute here. You're gonna realize why it's a good covenant, why it's better, like the writer of Hebrews says. But there's also promised, if you break covenant with me, you can expect X, Y, and Z. That is not pleasant to come. Why? Because the land is mine. He says it over and over in the old. The land is mine. I'm giving it to you to steward but it's my land. So if you wanna live here in this space, you've gotta walk according to my ways. Otherwise, I'll remove you out of the land. But because I promised Abraham to give it to you and to your forefathers, I will bring you back to the land because that's just the kind of God that I am. Are you with me? This is what he's telling. So Moses is about to die, and he sees them going in. You're about to hit it big in life. You're about to be successful. Your business is finally going to take off. You're going to graduate, and you're going to get that dream job that you always wondered. You're going to get off to college finally and not have mom and dad around, and you're going to live your life, and it's going to be like soaring all of a sudden. Don't forget God. Not even for a season. Don't forget him. This is the heart of Moses. And so see that as we go through this. If you don't get the gospel of grace, grace, it is favor and blessing that we do not deserve. You catch this? Favor and blessing from God that we do not deserve. That means we can't earn it. We didn't earn it. We won't earn it. It's something we get that should blow our minds and go, you don't deserve this. And you go, yes, I don't deserve this. That's why it's grace. The gospel of grace is what we talked about when we talked about Abraham. That God chose us, not because we're strong or mighty or or wise or whatever, but just because he did, he chose to love you. He chose to give you a hope and a future. He chose to come and actually die for you so you could have relationship and this inheritance he wants for you before you ever said yes to him. He did it in faith, hoping you would say yes. He did it before in hopes that he could lavish on you, as Ephesians 1 and 2 tells us, lavish on you for all time his blessings. That's his delight and desire. If you don't catch the gospel of grace and find your story there, 
you will miss everything about any conversation talking about giving, especially talking about money. Are you with me? You talk about money and it stirs up all kinds of weird, icky feelings. I'm gonna talk about tithing and first fruits. And as we talk about these things, pay attention to what's going on in here. Because if you hear something and something pops up in you and it's just an icky feeling about tithing and giving or whatever, pay attention. It's one of two things. It is either that icky feeling that comes with legalism that says you're never doing enough. God just wants more. Are you with me? I don't measure up. You're asking something of me that I don't, I don't think I can do it. Pay attention to that. Because that's not how God speaks. And pay attention to the other that comes up. When God's word begins to, to, to meddle a little bit with strongholds of a different spirit that wanted your loyalty in their life. Pay attention to those two things. Everything about this message says this. Giving is a response to the grace of God in your life. And the degree to which you see your story through the lens of grace that has been extended to you, you can understand why we even give ever. Are you with me? This is about giving with joy. Can I help you understand this? There is no other kind of giving. Done. Giving with joy is the only kind of giving that is ever prescribed in scripture. Giving out of duty doesn't exist in scripture. Giving just because he said doesn't exist in scripture. You won't find it in the Old Testament, you won't find it in the New Testament. Giving out of joy, you'll find it all through the Bible. Because it's the only kind of giving we were ever intended for. Are you with me? Are you sure? All right, that's why I get excited about this message. Because if I can undo some weird wiring inside of any of you this morning that just goes, Ugh, when it comes to giving, then I feel like, yes. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited for this message. So. Malachi chapter three, Malachi chapter three is where we're gonna go. There's a, a passage about giving, which is important, but it's about the heart of this book and where it falls in line. If you understand this, Malachi is all about calling people back to revival. It's the last book of the Old Testament so when you're Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, if you just go right before Matthew, you'll find Malachi in there. Last book of the Old Testament, chronologically probably one of the last books written in the Old Testament, and it's written after Israel has already experienced the warnings that Moses said, continue following with the Lord. Don't get comfortable in your stuff and then start thinking, I don't need God and go chase other gods or relegate God out here to something lesser. They've done that. They've been dispossessed from the land. They were in exile. And God had brought them back to the land. They had experienced all of the 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 blessings for a season, they'd experienced all of the curses of the covenant of walking away from God. They'd experienced all of that. Now they're back in the land. The temple had been rebuilt. Much smaller, lesser version of the temple. The walls around Jerusalem had finally been rebuilt. But what hadn't been rebuilt was the hearts of the people. As a nation, there were some who had and some who had not. And Malachi comes in, he's the prophet of God, and he's calling the people back to revival, to reviving their love for God. 
Because everything that we learn in this new covenant with God, in which you've been invited into because of what Jesus Christ has done, in this new covenant revolves around two things. Out of my love for God, out of my love for people. Everything I do out of my love for God and my love for people, that's the flow that God's invited us into. And any giving that comes out of my love for God or my love for people is what we have been invited to participate in. Are you with me? And Malachi is calling them back. And he's calling them back in in some different ways. One, he, he calls them back in their purity of their worship. And he's calling out pastors who've corrupted the worship, the priests, He's calling out the people and bringing these lame little offerings of sick and lame animals and, and, and half doing certain things and, and just saying, like the heart of a father, he's going, does a, does a father even deserve honor in his house? Well, yeah, but you don't even honor me. And it's super intimate and God gets really, really, really vulnerable with the people. It's like, what is this? And he calls them back in their worship. He calls them back in their marriages. Because marriage is that primary picture of covenant, of what relationship is supposed to be. And he says, what are you doing here? How have we walked away? They said, well, in your marriages, you're not faithful to each other anymore. Wasn't I present? Didn't I unite the two of you together with a portion of my spirit? How can you then fill your garments with violence and hate toward each other? Treat each other like trash. You're in covenant. That is matters. Love for God, love for people. And then this third way, he says, in your giving, in your offerings, in your tithes, he says, and your contributions, in this manner, Going into the land, God established a way of giving. Twice a year, the people would give of their tithes. This is where tithing in the law part, the prescripted tithing comes from. We talked about Abraham, tithing existed before the law. In Hebrews chapter seven, it exists now after the law. But during that time in the land, he did say, this is what you do. And twice a year they would take the tithes of the people and they'd bring them into the storehouses and it would provide for the priests and it would provide for the people and it would even provide for the sojourners in the land. They cared about everybody. That the land would know the, or the, the effect of generosity. It would be seen and felt everywhere. It was beautiful. And then the third year, in the third year, they'd take another tithe of everything and bring it for the continuing feast that they would have when they had their prescribed feast. But not only that, there were contributions and there were sacrifices. There were the contributions of the, of the first fruits that they would bring. So the very first, uh, first crop he says is mine, belongs to me. The very first animal that would come from is mine. The very first, you name it, was mine. And the Lord said, the first of everything that you get is mine. Why? All of this was after the heart. So here in Malachi chapter three, again, Malachi is calling people back to revival, reviving their heart for God. Three things we learn, that giving reflects our heart, that giving makes a statement, and that giving makes a distinction. So Malachi 3, giving reflects our heart. He says this, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside uh, from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby 
Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that you will not, it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your wine. Your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed. For you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. He begins by saying in this third come back to me. He begins by saying, I the Lord do not change. The Lord doesn't change. The God of the Old Testament, just so you know, is the God of the New Testament. He has not changed. Our God hasn't changed. But what we have been invited into in this new covenant of grace is a better covenant it's not that things in the, old, in the old covenant went away or were ever supposed to be disregarded anymore. In fact, when Jesus came onto the scene, you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. And what he does is he elevates the law. He takes adultery. They say, well, I didn't commit adultery. And he says, uh, adultery is in the heart. Are you with me? He says, Murder, I didn't murder anybody. He says, murder is in the heart. When you, when you want to say that to that person, and he says, listen, the law is not bad. The law is good, but I'm elevating the law to the status of you have no chance of ever keeping it. It's impossible for you to live perfectly before me is what Jesus says. And said, you need me. You need me, and that's what I'm coming to bring. I'm coming to bring a covenant that says, you bring nothing to the table. It's not two-sided anymore. It's one-sided. It's just me. Because you can't keep it. You're not good enough. Are you with me? He elevates it so much that none of us could go one day, God, you owe me. You ought to let me in. My good outweighs my bad. Listen, if we looked at our hearts, our bad outweighs everything. Are you kidding me? We just know smart enough not to say it. Most of the time. Then he says, I'm so right. I'm inviting you into a covenant where I took care of everything. But what I'm offering you is my righteousness so that you don't have to worry about your own. You get my righteousness, my forgiveness. You get what I've done for you. This is the new covenant, but in that, I've called you to this level of living, this Live like me so that the nations around you, so that the people around you can see who I am through your life. You're still called to be a blessing. You're called to be a blessing. He says, I don't change, meaning you're still alive. That's the best way of understanding that. I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you're still breathing. You're lucky. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. I've not changed my mind from that plan. So they say, how do we return? Listen, that language is so intimate. How do I return? How, return to me? Return to me. Return to me. Come back. Is the God of the universe appealing with human beings? Give me a break. Come back. Come back to me. Well, how do we do that? What are you asking of us? It's all covenant language. In your tithes and in your contributions. There is always, and don't downplay this, a connection between our giving and our heart. We'd love to say there isn't. I can love God and never go to church. Baloney. I can love God and never give baloney. I can love God and, and just kind of, you know, not do certain things. It is our love for God that motivates all of our giving. Everything. It affects our hearts. I was listening to somebody talk about their differences between their boys and they have one son that's always a saver. It's a saver. He saved all the money, always saving. And then he met this girl <laughs> that he married. 
And he said, I knew my son was smitten when he's talking to me about buying a coach purse and doing this and then spending all, he basically spending all his money on her. Why? Because our heart is tied. It is tied. Are you hearing me? It does matter. And God is saying, listen, I'm calling my people back to revival, back to a relationship with me, back to being on fire with me. I'm doing that. How do we get back? What do we do to come back? Just come back to what I've invited you into in your tithes and in your contributions. He said, a tenth of everything that you bring in, the increase, bring that in. And your first fruits from the fields and the flocks, bring it in. And in doing so, and in doing so, keep your heart soft toward me. There's more I should say on this, but I can't. I will say this, the beginning place, tithes and offerings are just the training wheels of generosity. What you find in the New Testament is when the church comes alive, you find people whose hearts are so transformed by the grace of God that it's not about a percent anymore. It's just about, it's all yours, Lord. That's really how they live. But he invites us here. And so tithing is that 10%. It's just the training wheels. If you're gonna live fearlessly generous, it's just the training wheels. It's what's my starting point. But from there... If it's coming from this place of my love for God and love for people, you'll find it will flow way more than that. Religion teaches us to give in order to get. So what do I get out of this? But God invites his people here to just come taste and see. Taste and see. I love that he says, test me. Why would he say test me? Is the only place in your entire Bible where God invites us to test him. It's a beginning place. So test me in this, the Lord says. I'm just, I'm, good. I'm so after your heart, I'll take it, just test, just start, just try. You tell me, you tell me if I can't take care of you. But come from this place of understanding your story. And that leads us into the second, giving makes a statement. Giving makes a statement. It reflects our heart, but it also makes a statement. It was always intended to make a statement. It's supposed to be a statement that I make every time I give. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. It is pointless. Let's just put terms on this. It is pointless to be a Christian. It is pointless to do God's way. This, what's the value in this? What is the profit of keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts in a heart that's repentant is what it's saying. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they get away with it. Serving God is pointless is what they're saying. This is what he's calling them in. He's calling us out. Some of you, he's calling out. You, you might have felt this way. It's all this Christian, this is all pointless stuff. I gotta go to church, I gotta. Listen, you don't gotta do nothing. You don't. You don't have to do anything. God will love you regardless of what you do. If you give 10% or 2%, or 1% or no percent, he's not gonna love you more when you give 10 or 15%. You can't make him love you more. You can't make him love you less. He just loves you. He's crazy about you. He died for you. That's the gospel. That's the truth of it all. That's the heart of where it comes from. But he says, well, what do we get out of it? Why would they ask a question? That's what religion asks. Religion asks, what is in it for me? What's the benefit? What's the return on my investment? That's what it asks. And so if I do this, I ought to expect that from God. It 
It says the self-confident, the self-made, the self-assured, and the self-sufficient people are the ones that we envy and we admire. The ones who live like we don't need God anymore. Those are the ones that we put on the stage. Those are the ones that we say, whoa, aren't they blessed? Is that true? Is that true? It's certainly true of our culture, but is that true of the things that you say as you're processing this message? Well, those are the ones I want to be like. Why? Because they got millions. They got fame. I don't know. He says, people who do much worse things than me seem to be getting away with it. Anybody ever said that? How are they getting away with it? God doesn't care. Yes, he does. God doesn't see. Yes, he does. He knows and he sees. So the question is, how does tithing and giving my first to God benefit me? What's the return on my investment? That's the question religion asks. So in Deuteronomy 26, I won't have time to read the whole passage. It says this, again, this is going into the land the heart of a father for the people, saying, here's why we do what we do. It says, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you and put it in a basket. Now catch the picture. They actually did pass a basket back then. Um, so those of you who've been to church a long time, like, where's the basket passing? I guess it comes all the way back to this time. <laughs> and you're gonna go to the place that God will choose, and when you get there, this is what you're gonna say. I declare today, the Lord your God, that I have come into the land that the Lord swore my fathers to give us. I make a declaration. I'm bringing my basket, my first fruits, and I'm making a statement. I declare today, that God did what he said he would do. That God delivered me out of Egypt. That God brought me through seasons of wilderness. That God was faithful. I declare that God has brought me now to this place of understanding and experiencing his grace. And you shall make response before the Lord your God, verse five, a wandering Aramean, speaking of Abraham, was my father. When he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, and we were few in number, And there he became a nation, great and mighty and populous, and the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And he brought us to this place, and I bring the first fruit from the ground of which, O Lord, you have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship there, and you shall rejoice. Not only you, your house, the Levite, the the, the priest, and the sojourner among you. Giving is meant to be a statement. When I bring it, my first fruits and my tithe, I bring it and I make a declaration, you did this in my life. My story is the story of the gospel of grace. You delivered me from sin. You brought me out of bondage to sin and slavery and bondage to Satan and his power or his claim on my life. You brought my family out of that fate And you brought us into a better place, this place, this place of promise. You brought us into a hope that is living, alive, that is still even yet to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God to come. You did this in my life. It's a statement. Do you see the picture? That's why all giving is supposed to come from joy. And if it doesn't come from joy, can I say as a pastor, don't give and recalibrate back to that. Recalibrate back to your story. Who are you? What is the grace of God in your life? 
Go back to that place. Do you give as a response to his grace in your life is the question. And then last, I'll just gloss it. Giving makes a distinction. The last statement there in Malachi 3, it says basically there were people who were listening to what Malachi was saying and inviting to this message of revival and come back. They were listening and receiving and hearing and it says they spoke to each other and encouraged each other and God was watching and a book was open and their names were being written down. And he says, there will be a day. Basically the second coming, speaking of what is to come. When the righteous and the wicked are separated and you will then see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. It may look now like the wicked are getting away with everything, that the arrogant are blessed and those that say, I don't need God. And your heart might get a little cynical in that space. And he says, oh no, remember, God sees. And there's gonna be a distinction. But the distinction for you right now is that you know your story. The story of the grace of God in your life. Are you with me? Please stand.